Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you this morning Professor Marta Kwiatkowska. She's Professor of Computing Systems at the University of Oxford. She has made fundamental contributions to the theory and practice of model checking for probabilistic systems and is known, very well known, for the PRISM model checker developed in her group that has been adopted in diverse fields. Marta was elected ACM Fellow last year, and just last week it was announced that she's been awarded the 2018 Royal Society Milner Award, and I'm delighted to also say that she's the first woman to receive it. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> Marta gave a wonderful introduction to these topics earlier at this conference at the Verification Mentoring Workshop on Sunday. And today, she's going to talk about a topic that should be cons of concern to us all because deep neural networks are or will soon be everywhere around us. And it's only fitting that at CAV, we should be worried about their safety. Look forward to your talk, okay. Marta. Thank you, RT. Thank you uh, for the congratulations. Thanks, everybody, for the congratulations. Uh, it's very exciting to uh, be recognized through uh, Robin Milner Award because I was working with Robin Milner a few years ago uh, on ubiquitous computing and trying to raise the profile of formal methods, actually the science of ubiquitous computing. And my work is continuing. Um, what I want to talk about today is actually specifically designed to raise awareness within the verification community of the problem that deep neural networks are presenting to us all. Um, and this is a topic that uh, I have started working on as part of a collaboration, large collaboration grant that I have with engineers at Oxford from the, the Oxford Robotics Institute. And this has exposed me to very many and very interesting and very challenging problems. And the problem that I'm going to talk about today is safety verification for deep networks. Uh, this is something that not many people seem to worry about yet, uh, but I hope to make my case and I would be willing to discuss with you later. So I suppose if you read the news, whether this is in the internet or, you know, newspapers or whatever your news, favorite news channel is, you will be aware that uh, deep learning has uh, been making uh, great strides. In fact, the idea of uh, neural networks was first proposed in the 1940s, but at the time, the computers couldn't really do much. Uh, so it wasn't until really 2006 when the first deep neural networks were trained. And the word deep means that they have more than five or six layers. Uh, these days, it's not just about the layers, it is also about how many neurons we have in the layers. Now, you will have heard about convolutional networks, perhaps. Uh, they are credited uh, you know, to a paper which appeared in 2012, but in fact, they were conceived in 1998. Uh, by Jan Lecun, and believe it or not, this happened in the Bell Labs building, which I visited two weeks ago, and I was shown the room. I won't be able to show it to you uh, at the outtakes, but if you want to talk to me about this, you know, please do. Uh, so, deep learning is only a few years old. Uh, but since the rectifier units were introduced and the vision breakthrough was made, and by the vision breakthrough, I mean uh, the fact that deep learning was demonstrated to be as good as humans on image recognition tasks. Uh, and last year, it won against humans at Go. 
Okay, so it is really an amazing, you know, progress. And why now? Why not in the 1940s? Well, first of all, deep learning, especially supervised learning, needs a lot of data and labeled data. And where does this data come from? Well, these days it comes from, for example, Instagram. Uh, and there is a lot of big data around, so that's why it's a lot, of, a lot easier uh, to develop deep learning models. They are with the help of uh, technologies and tools, for example, that Google is providing, TensorFlow, Keras, etc. The models are very flexible and very easy to build and experiment with. But of course, they are very compute hungry. But here, you know, again, <coughs> we've got a lot of help from GPUs and efficient interest, uh, inference. So because of this, uh, as Artie already mentioned, there is much, much interest from industry and in particular tech companies. I'm not sure how much you are aware because this is happening, you know, uh, at the back end. For example, Facebook is using it for face recognition. Uh, do you know Google Translate has switched to using deep learning? And if you have Amazon Echo, Alexa, as my daughter does, well, uh, it also uses it for voice recognition. And there is more interest. It's coming into healthcare and personalized medicine is mentioned. Nature, for example, has been publishing a lot of deep learning papers. This one in particular is using deep learning for uh, cancer um, um, classification. Uh, but of course, there were many, many nature papers as well, even about the win at go. And there is more. So now deep learning has entered uh, automotive industry. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of videos. So this is NVIDIA. This is a car which is called BB-8. You probably know more about it than you do. It was first presented in January 2000 and, uh, this year, earlier this year. And if you watch, have a look, it drives itself. Okay, you know, we know that cars can drive themselves. Google have been doing that, Waymo is doing it, Tesla is doing it. So what's special about this car? Uh, okay, uh, I mean, did you also notice that, you know, it perceives its surroundings, looks at traffic signs, makes, makes the correct decisions, okay? So why did I choose this car because I actually had a ride in it, uh, not in the other one, in this one, it looks the same. If you visit New Jersey, um, students are testing that software uh, and testing for students means driving the car around in G New Jersey. You will also see it in Santa Clara. So this is NVIDIA, not many people are associating NVIDIA uh, with um, uh, autonomous driving, but they have one advantage. And the person uh, who is leading the group that I visited is Urs Müller, and you saw him in here in this challenge on Lombard Street. Okay, so why am I showing you these videos? So let me just recap. So what's uh, driving that car that you saw is actually a neural network. It is a neural network which works as an end-to-end -end controller. So if you went to the talk yesterday by Gats, Guy Katz, uh, he had a neural network for UAVs. This is an end controller neural network for autonomous driving. So the input is a camera image, uh, and then it produces control outputs as a regression as a regression function, so it produces continuous angle, angles that the car needs to turn. It's a feed-forward neural network, if you know about them. It doesn't have any memory, so at the moment it can do lane keeping and lane changing, but only on trigger. It doesn't have memory, so for example, it will not be able to negotiate its way when it changes lane uh, yet. 
Uh, how is it trained? Well, it is trained on data which NVIDIA has obtained by driving the car around and recording what the car sees and also the human-driven control controls, you know, turns. Um, this is not uh, the only training data. They also have to provide artificial data, for example, to tell the car when it is slightly sort of too close to the edge that it needs to turn back in. Um, now, and why this? Because NVIDIA actually has a very powerful GPU, and this is the box that you can put in your car, and it's attracting interest of a lot of uh, automotive companies. Uh, now, what you also saw is a traffic sign recognition. Now, traffic sign recognition problem is a classification problem where the input again is an image, and, but the output is you want to recognize it as a, as a particular traffic sign or not. And what you saw in the NVIDIA car is actually not a deep neural network, but of course these neural network solutions already exist, and this is what I'm going to focus on, but really motivated by these types of solutions in other cars, not in the NVIDIA car. Well, but this brings me to my main point. We in the verification community are really uh, obsessed about correctness and precision and rigor in our arguments. I mean, to the extent that when we are talking about value iteration, you know, value iteration when you want to compute uh, probability in a probabilistic system, we really worry whether this is, you know, with precision 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 8. Okay? But this is a probabilistic world. There, you know, neural networks don't come with any guarantees. So we are talking about the technology that's already entered because it's very easy for engineers to start playing around with neural networks, but there are no principles, no guarantees, you know, on what the network is trying to do. So if you are interested, PilotNet, there is a paper on archive which I'm cited there, where PilotNet, which is a cut-down version of the network, uh, was released by NVIDIA, and they are planning to release the data as well. Okay, so this is what you've seen in these videos, but uh, what uh, you have also seen, that the car sees, okay? It said that it perceives it, its surroundings. Uh, so, for example, so this is not the network in there. What I'm taking is state-of-the-art networks. These are the ones that match the human ability. And what I'm showing it is an image of a traffic sign, okay? And giving it slightly modified in a way that you probably don't see, okay? We are talking about camera images that are, you know, 60 times 180 pixels, so they are not very precise, and they are misclassified, okay? If I have time, I can show you in that take what happens when this is misclassified, because I have some videos about that. Okay, so this is another example, is the Nexa traffic sign benchmark. So now I'm showing you specific <laughs> misclassifications. I have a red light, which is modified to green only after 18 pixels has, have changed, okay? Um, so this is actually on a smaller network, and it's poorer network than you had before. But you can imagine what this will do to the NVIDIA car. <laughs> if you, if it, instead of seeing a green light, it actually, uh, you know, has the, well, the other way around, maybe. Um, Okay, so appropriately, since we are in Heidelberg, I can also show you some German traffic sign <laughs> benchmarks. So these are reduced in size to get faster results, so they are 32 by 32 pixels. And what I'm showing you actually is uh, an image, and an image manipulated by our tool. And this one is a stop sign, that one is recognized as a 30 
mile speed limit. Uh, 80 mile speed limit, switch to 30 mile speed limit. Go right, switch to go straight. Uh, and the interesting thing is that these very wrong results are with confidence, which is as high as confidence in the correct result. And sometimes they could be even higher than the confidence in the correct result. And you know that's how, um, that's how neural networks work. There are some approaches now to consider a, you know, a, a, a Bayesian uh, interpretation, but they, have, they are not widespread yet. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you are sort of connected to the news. Um, uh, you know, people say, ah, you know, but these are all artificial. You know, they don't happen in the physical world. But you see papers where they take a photograph of this, give it to the camera and say, well, okay, actually this is in the real world. But I will show you uh, from two weeks ago an example from the real world. It's not to do with the NVIDIA, I need to say. Uh, you can find out this is a Tesla. Um, and someone is driving the Tesla on the autopilot and it mistakes the 101 highway sign in California for a speed limit of 105, okay? And reproduced every day this week. I don't know what Tesla is using, but I know that some automotives are using deep learning precisely for these tasks. Okay, so you know that's the main point that I'm trying to <laughs> to make, and I'm trying to uh, get verification uh, community interested in these problems. But if you look at um, the machine learning community, they know about this. So uh, this is uh, known as instability of neural networks with respect to adversarial perturbations. And it was uh, first observed in 2014. Okay, so these are the time scales in a lifetime of uh, practical neural networks. Uh, and they are still not very well understood. So the first idea was to take an image and then add some noise. Um, and then it turns out that the network will misclassify it. So this one is a gibbon. And sometimes, as I said, even with higher confidence. So the focus in these papers is on adding noise to the image in such a way that the modified image looks the same to the human. Because this is considered a security risk and a possible attack. Okay? Uh, so the noise is sometimes artificial, but the dangerous things, thing about adversarial perturbations is that they are transferable. That means if you show one for one network, then on a network, even with a different architecture for the same problem, on different training data, it will also be an adversarial example. So it is a big problem. So uh, I'm working on a slightly different problem. If I take you back to this, I'm looking at a problem that a self-driving car will face when it tries to perceive the environment, because these images of traffic signs are not going to be perfect. Uh, there will be imperfections, there will be camera angle changes, and the, you know this one is trying to, to explore uh, how far you know you need to push the neural network for to force it into a misclassification so risk and in particular probabilistic risk has already been considered in machine learning and deep learning of course is part of machine learning now uh, in machine learning people are concerned with extracting information and knowledge from data but they don't know much about the data so the assumption is that the input probability distribution is not known and they are well aware in machine learning that you can if you build your model you can misclassify it uh, but they can't work with the input distribution so they have an empirical uh, risk minimization which is just the distribution of the test data. But to reflect the reality, you have to make sure that the test data really reflects the real data that the neural network uh, will see. 
Uh, now, because of uh, the danger of adversarial examples, there has been substantial growth in techniques to evaluate the robustness of these networks. And the robustness is different from risk. There are different measures. The usual measure is what they do is they compute the minimal expected distance to misclassification. Or, you know, if you think about it, the minimum norm of the noise vector that you need to add. And then this is weighted with respect to, again, not the input distribution because that's unknown, but with respect respect to uh, the test data distribution. And there have been several methods that have been developed. The usual method is just to follow the gradient uh, sign of the cost function. There are methods based on optimization, but of course they are nonlinear, so optimization is uh, approximate. There are constraint-based methods as well. There is adversarial training, uh, which is the idea is that you try to exercise the neural network uh, on adversarial examples, which you can then try to take into account in training. And there is even a paper from EPFL where uh, they have come up with a way to construct universal adversarial examples. So you take a, you know, a whole group of networks for a classification problem. So there is a lot of work happening sort of in the machine learning community and some, I think, across the verification community. But what I'm doing here is slightly different. So first of all, I'm going to focus on uh, a classification problem, and I'm going to consider a simple first notion of safety of a classification problem. So I'm really focusing on issues where, you know, you have a traffic sign, but you know that the traffic sign that the car sees is not perfect. So it will suffer from some perturbations, lighting conditions, glare. Think of Tesla, uh, the fatal accident of Tesla, etc. You know, there could be wear and tear. Uh, and I want to uh, make sure that this uh, will not result in dangerous class changes. That means a traffic sign that's recognized should be recognized as stop and looks to a human as a stop sign is recognized as go, for example. And, and I'm focusing here on individual decisions uh, as a starting point. So the idea is that there will be these critical decisions, perhaps the stop sign, uh, where you might want to exercise the network. Um, and this is uh, a way to also link up to explainable AI, uh, because even though I'm working with image classification networks, if you have a network that also produces justification, then you can try to apply the same method also to consider safety of that decision because it's point-based. And there is a um, tool that's available on GitHub. You ca there is a link in the paper, and there is more experimental data. Uh, the methodology is really very basic, but via reduction to SMT, but it is search-based. Uh, so there are lots and lots of possibilities to improve. OK, so these are the types of networks uh, that I'm talking about. I'm talking about feed-forward neural networks. Uh, and in a kind of image classification problem, what you have is uh, a group of images. They, are, they form a vector space where each point is actually an image. And that image is, is a three-dimensional array. Uh, so for something like the German recognition traffic sign, it was 32 times 32, plus the depth is the color. But uh, for ImageNet, it's much larger. It's 228 times 228, again, plus color. And this is just a single point. Uh, and what uh, this network will do is it will apply, take an image, and then it will apply convolutions. So it will just stride a kernel across the image to extract features, and it does it through the layers. And then uh, it will use this rectifier function, ReLU, which is simply max 
to zero. So in here, it will be applying a linear operation and then max sig to zero, and it is also a max pooling layer, which is a kind of down sampling. And when it, trans it takes this image, transforms it, you can see how these features are extracted. When it gets to the final layer, it produces a score, which is a value for every um, uh, class label here, and that score is put into so-called softmax, which normalizes the scores to a probability distribution on the data. And in this case, it has decided it's a car. Okay? Uh, and the problem setting is as follows. So one thing I wanted to draw your attention to is we are talking here about perhaps 16 layers. Uh, that's already a deep network from five to six, but here we are talking potentially about hundreds of thousands of neurons in each layer. That's the scalability challenge. So from the point of view of the problem setting, uh, we have the input layer, the output layer, but we also have hidden layers. They are called hidden layers in between, uh, through which the image is transformed, and each has a vector space associated with it. And what we want to model, the specification for the image classification problem, is a function which will take an image and give it a class label, okay, cat or dog, uh, as if a human would give it. So the idea is to model the human perception ability. But we only approximate it. We approximate it using this deep network, and you, we apply supervised learning. So what you have to give it is a set of pairs of an image and a class label, perhaps you know, assigned by the human, normally assigned by the human in this case. And for each layer, we are going to have activation functions where each activation function will apply a linear transformation, okay, a linear transformation of that image by a matrix of weights plus a bias, and then take, uh, you know, ReLU, which is max with zero. Um, uh, and everything else, the whole behavior of the network is actually function composition. Now, these weights and bias is something that the network learns, applies something like back propagation using supervised learning techniques. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a trained network. So I'm not going, I'm going to is take a network that has already been trained. So I'm going to work with fixed weights and bias. So this is what we have, okay? But what we want to do is we want to do a classification which is as good as human. So I'm going to show you now an image which uh, um, I've taken from a blog on the Clever Hans website from Ian Goodfellow, uh, which explains uh, what the problem is. Okay, so what we have is this here is a class decision boundary. So we have two classes. Inside that dotted shape, you have one class, all around it is another class, okay? That's what we want to classify. But then, because when we build a, a neural network, we give it a set of training data, okay, these training data, the neural network will have its own model boundary, but there is no reason to suppose that they would overlap. Okay, because in fact that distribution is is unknown. So this is the this is the situation, um, and what you then do after training is you provide a set of test data which you've not used in the training data, um, and now what you can see is the test data will exercise the model in different ways. So, for example, what might happen is if you have a test data here, in between these points, the network has to interpolate. Okay? You may be, if you push this point a little bit, you will discover a weakness in the way that it interpolates. Uh, what you also see is you can push the test points, and this is what the adversarial examples are trying to do, to 
task decision boundary or model decision boundary. Okay, so these are the points which are particularly dangerous because the classification flips. Okay, the classification flips. Uh, so I'll come back to this when I explain what you know we are trying to do. But that's that's the actual problem that we are um, studying. Right. So I've mentioned robustness. Okay. Uh, so what um, uh, machine learning people like Jeffrey, Jeffrey Hinton, who actually came up with the idea, they apply a notion of randomization at training, which is called dropout. So at a training point, they select uh, uh, you know, nodes, neurons at random and remove them. Okay, and then reweight the probability distributions. Recently, this was shown to be equivalent to approximate uh, Bayesian inference. So there is a you know probabilistic uh, uh, foundation uh, uh, to that. And the idea of regularization is to improve smoothness. Okay, and that smoothness, I was saying, you, they need to interpolate. They also need to extrapolate because you may give it a data point which is far away from you know, the class boundaries. And there is a common smoothness assumption, and I think everybody from the kind of hybrid you know, community will understand. Uh, we are talking about real valued, you know, real valued you know, arrays here. You know, maybe uh, in some cases, uh, sometimes not because you might work with pixels, but um, uh, so um, uh, the idea is that if you pick a particular point, there should be some region around it. Think about some epsilon ball where the classification is invariant, doesn't change. So if you shift a little bit, it should not change. It would be a nice property, you know, for a network to have because you know that the uh, measurements will be imprecise, so sensor measurements will be imprecise. So this is the kind of problem that I'm tackling uh, here. And this problem is known as pointwise robustness. So if I take the function, classification function that my network implements, which approximates the real classification function, given a point X and some region around it, if you can find another point in that region, which is most classified as something else, then that's an adversarial example. Okay? Now, robustness network property is uh, then averaged. So what you can do is you can optimize, you can set up an optimization problem where you compute the minimum distance to that perturbation and then you weight it with respect to the test data. And that's called robustness, network property, but I'm working with pointwise robustness. Okay, why? Because I want to do verification for neural networks, which was a problem that's little studied, although I have to say at Flock uh, uh, 2010, which was in Edinburgh, there was a first paper which identified uh, the problem uh, and proposed an SMT solution. But at that time, neural networks were working with sigmoid activation functions. Okay? They were not working with ReLU activation functions. Uh, what's special about ReLU is that they are nonlinear, but it's a weak notion of nonlinearity. They're actually piecewise linear. So if you have a look, they are trying to approximate sigmoid using piecewise linear functions, but then actually these piecewise linear functions were introduced via ReLU into deep networks. Okay? So that's mathematically speaking, that's what these networks are working with. And you heard a talk about this uh, from Guy yesterday, where they are considering uh, the end-to-end -end controller problem, but in a simpler setting where you only have five outputs, so you can consider it as a classification problem. But you can do more general properties than what I'm considering. Right, so I want to focus on safety of classification decisions. So, as I said, there is a point, there is a region which I call eta. It doesn't have to have a ball shape. It could, in, in fact, be any shape, but I'm going for now 
focus on an epsilon ball, okay? And we know that if you find an example here which classifies as something different, but only here, I don't worry there, okay? Only here, then that's, that's an adversarial example that's unsafe because this is this decision that I'm looking at. But of course, this raises a lot of issues. What should the diameter be? Okay, o obviously the diameter cannot be too big because if it is too big, it will overlap. The two classes may overlap. So you may be looking for adversarial examples which are actually true examples of the other class. Um, another thing, what should the norm be? Uh, and this is uh, still an unsolved problem because ideally, if I take an image okay, of a cat, here you should have only cats and you should have you know, another area there where you would have only dogs. So this should model some image similarity. But all the papers uh, in adversarial examples, they are working with mostly the L2 norm, which is the Euclidean distance. Some are working also with the Manhattan distance, the L1 norm, L0 norm, which simply counts the number of pixels that you've changed, actually all LPs or L infinity, which is max, taking the max, uh, the largest uh, change that you've made in the image. And neither really models this image similarity. So if you want to focus on the image classification problem, we need to do something better here. I don't have the answers, but neither do uh, uh, people in machine learning. And another thing is, of course, you know, this is, uh, this problem is impossible because there are, you know, infinitely many, uncountably many possible manipulations. So, you know, I could not do anything. So I'm going to focus on uh, manipulations to the image which should really, you know, uh, be invariant with respect to the classification. Why? Well, because there could be some minor scratches, okay, oh, but uh, more importantly, snow, you know, on your stop sign, camera angle, etc. So in, uh, you know, in, uh, when they are training uh, networks for using these autonomous systems, for example, for self-driving cars, they also have to consider these other conditions, driving in the snow, in the rain, etc., or collect data. So that's not, but I'm considering a situation where there is, you know, something really potentially dangerous, and I want to exercise that day training, okay, that day training has uh, worked. So what I do is I worked with the simplest notion of safety of a classification decision, which is parameterized by this set of manipulations. And I'm going to work with concrete sets of manipulations, which are very simple. Um, and I'm going to assume that there is also a region, so some diameter around the point, which is just this fundamental smoothness property. And within that, I will just adopt the point-wise robustness notion to check as a safety criterion. Uh, but that will be with respect to these manipulations only. Okay, other manipulations I won't be checking, and I will not be checking beyond the edge of the region. Uh, and I'm going to work with the exhaustive search, so I'm really going to go back to 1980s, the early days of model checking. Uh, it's a search-based method, but I'm going to be hit with lots of challenges. High dimensionality, it's hundreds of thousands of neurons in each layer. Uh, the functions are nonlinear, uh, you know, so the boundaries between classes are nonlinear. Uh, there are infinitely many points. We are working with really sophisticated vector spaces, uh, etc. huge scale. Uh, so what I'm going to focus on is to come up with some guarantees of safety, if I can reduce it to a finite set, then I will be able to rule out adversarial examples. Okay, but because my method is search-based, I can also apply it to falsification. So the same as we know about verification versus backfinding. And what's backfinding? Well, this is looking for adversarial examples as attacks, but not for guarantees. So I want to be in this space, but we've also compared it uh, against that. So thanks to Ian Goodfellow and Nicola Papernot on their website, uh, you can also see 
the green blobs of what we are trying to do. <laughs> okay? Uh, so before you said, you know, you had these points. If you push them, you find an adversarial example. But with my method, I will try to find, you know, these regions for small balls, if it, if it works, if you can scale up and rule out adversarial examples in there. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, and really, thanks to them for the pictorial representation. Right, so I'll just give you uh, sort of some details. Okay, so the, the main problem is that the size of the network is prohibitive. Um, and uh, this is why, uh, you know, in order to scale up to something like ImageNet, which is 2 to 8 times 2 to 8 image, um, we set up a framework which analyzes one layer at a time and propagates the results from layer to layer. In fact, you can start from an arbitrary layer. You can, for example, look at the penultimate layer because that's where, you know, the features have already been extracted. Uh, but if you start, uh, you know, from uh, the first layer, you can try to at least go and rule out the most obvious problems. But there is also something that I completely sweep under the carpet. In fact, we are not working at the level of individual neurons when we want to scale up to images. Uh, we have to work at the level of features, and features are actually sets of neurons, okay? This is key to obtain the scalability, but this works only under an assumption that features are independent, and that assumption, I'm told by Ian Goodfellow, is not always guaranteed. So this, I'm oh sorry, the, uh, so this, what we are doing differs from heuristic search. So all the other works in machine learning, you know, they are searching, they are searching for attacks. Uh, they methods are approximate because this is a nonlinear optimization problem, but they reduce it to box constraint optimization. Um, they have no guarantee of precise adversarial examples and no guarantee of exhaustive search because they are effectively using stochastic guided, you know, search. And of course, stochastic guided means that you cannot cover the whole range. So the situation that uh, I have is as follows. So here are the layers. So each layer, you know, is a collection of neurons here, and here is my image. So as I was explaining, this image is transformed through a linear transformation followed by typically ReLU, uh, or, you know, sometimes it's uh, uh, max pooling, so it's down something, so it's transformed. But I start with some region, so I can map, I can map this region, of course, via the activation function, okay? Uh, but what I also assume that I have uh, a mapping going back, I've slightly simplified it here, and I will explain in a minute why I need this mapping going back. Now, when you have an image X, when you get here, this is, I'm going to assume, is already a misclassification, but this is the, active, the value of the activation in the final layer. So that's the input layer, that's the images, and this is cats, dogs, etc. Okay? Uh, so what I have is, uh, uh, you know, a situation where I ha specify an image and an epsilon ball around an image and want to explore, you know, this, this epsilon ball here. And what I will do is I will work at a time in a specific layer. And uh, I need to look for misclassification. So if you think about it, what does it mean? If you are in this layer, okay, then a misclassification will be found here. So whenever I'm looking, I also need to make a forward search and check whether this is misclassified. That is, is, is it giving me a different class? But some of these adversarial examples can be spurious, so you may recognize the terminology. So I also need to check whether uh, the image that this value that I'm exploring has come from, okay, and I have some arbitrary value, that this value actually is to a human 
okay, an adversarial example. Uh, so I will show you examples also of you know what we do uh, with that. So for this, I need uh, slight conditions on that. Uh, so I but I can map the region forward via phi, and I also need this inverse. Now I also uh, will consider a family of operators. So ideally, you would like to have an algebra structure on these operators, for example, a group. Uh, but we haven't made progress in that direction yet. So we are looking at very simple mappings of pixels. You can move pixels to a different position, or you can simply change the intensity of pixels. You can put snow on, for example. You can change the glare. You can introduce various modifications. That's the only things we have tried. And the idea is that the classification should be invariant with respect to such manipulations. And then given what I've uh, told you, safety at a point uh, with respect to the region and that set of manipulations means that if I perturbed within that region, then the class change will not, um, uh, you know, there will be no class change. Uh, now the manipulations are user defined and norms can also be user-defined, of course, providing you can reduce them to SMT. We have worked with L0, one L2, and l -sup. Uh And they could be specific to each layer if you have the intuition. Of course, the best intuition comes from images. And manipulations can also be applied directly on features. What the convolutions do is they actually extract features from the image, and you can try to manipulate features, and that's what we do. Okay, so there are there are two um, uh, uh, you know components of the framework, and the first one is uh, well, I have a region, but this is in a vector space, and there are uncountably many points in that region. I need to find a way to reduce it to a finite search because otherwise, I you know my search will not be exhaustive. And I think this is one of the magics that I think we are using well in. Uh, in uh, verification. Now, if you think about my images, if I focus on camera images, they are essentially discretized because they are pixels. So I can assume a minimum step okay, that I explore. Of course, this will be hugely inefficient, but in theory, you know, it suffices to say that you can do it through a finite exploration. So I'm going to have a notion of a minimality of a manipulation, which means if you manipulate something, there should be no manipulation in between. Okay? So if you manipulate in one you know, pixel steps, then you will be able to, to do it. Now, and what do you do? Well, so at the moment you search, and if you find it, well, you can put it back into training. In some examples, this is straightforward to decide. In other examples, this is not straightforward to decide because the human may need to decide. Uh, ideally, you would want to do an abstraction refinement framework, but we are not at that stage yet. Uh, now, if you don't find it, you can declare that region safe for these manipulations. So you can say, OK, it's uh, robust to snow. And the methodology itself is just simply discretize. Uh, and I'm going to build a structure that I can then explore uh, and cover. And what I'm doing is I'm actually introducing a concept because I want to reduce the problem to counting of misclassifications. And that way, I want to reduce it to an SMT problem. So what I have um, okay, here is, you know, I have a a situation where I have this region is now square, okay? And the, this is the point that I'm manipulating, and you see all the possible manipulations. So if you pull up that point, think about the tree. There is a tree that I will be exploring, but only until you hit the edge. And along the tree, I will be following all the non-deterministically chosen paths, and along the paths, I will be counting misclassifications, okay? If I end up with zero, I haven't found anything, okay? But otherwise, I found an adversarial example and I can feed back to the input layer to find out what this is. So it's interesting because this is similar to what uh, they are doing when searching for adversarial examples. 
because this is this um, similar to a single step stochastic gradient and following a path is similar to an iterative uh, method that was introduced, but they have not done the full exploration. And what we do, we also do a Monte Carlo tree search, which has a probabilistic guarantee uh, of exploration. So then what I do is I uh, have a reduction to SMT uh, for the exploration of the region, and now I propagate the analysis starting you know, from the layer, and if I haven't found anything, I move to the next layer. But if I found something, I stop. And I wish I could do something with the counterexample, something like abstraction refinement, and continue. But at the moment, I can't. OK. Um, yeah, so because of the way that the framework is set up, you know, if you prove it for the case layer, then all the layers up until k are also safe. So if you manage to get to the end, you know, you've verified the safety. But of course, some of these examples can be spurious. And I wish I could say that for ImageNet, we can do, uh, you know, uh, exhaustive verification, but we can't. So we are still using a lot of heuristics, and in particular, the, the main uh, assumption that we are using is we are working with features and we are assuming independence of features. Uh, but I will show you, uh, you know, some, uh, some pictures of what. I'll skip that. If you are interested in the implementation, it is using Z3. Uh, and, of course, it was set up so that we can reduce it to linear real arithmetic. So I have a counting problem, and I work with, in, in this case, Euclidean and Manhattan norms. And in comparison, uh, the difference is that the approaches that try to reduce the whole network to a huge constraint problem uh, you know, they will not scale up to those networks because they already, you know, it's very hard uh, for them to work even with, you know, more than 300 nodes. But I don't build the whole constraint system, I only build a constraint system for a layer, for each layer at a time. Now, the main challenge is, of course, how to define these meaningful regions, manipulations, and verification itself, but we've discovered that finding adversarial examples is very quick. So I can show you what uh, you know this tool can do. So what I'm showing you here is a simple point classification problem. So the input is a, a point, and we have trained the network okay, to classify these points into being above or below. So for that, you need to think about it that there is, you know, uh, this is the real task boundary. But we've trained it you know, on a boundary which is slightly different than that. And I take this point and allow manipulations okay, into, I can move this point to any of these. Uh, this is uh, a four layer, I think three, four layer network, which has 20 neurons, uh, I think, in the hidden layers. And it doesn't find anything in uh, the first layer. But when it maps the region to the second layer and explores it, it also maps the manipulations to the second layer. And then when it explores it, it finds a class change in here. And in this case, it's very easy to say that, yes, this point should be in the training data, because this is a very tricky situation where the network needs more data in order to be able to build uh, better model boundaries, model boundaries that closer match the problem. Some other examples that we have, the everybody has to do uh, tests with MNIST. This is really very easy to find. There are lots of misclassifications that you can find in GitHub and on the web page. But, um, you know, I'm just stressing that these are state-of-the-art networks. This is another MNIST example. Uh, we can do comparison with existing methods. So just to show you, there is the noise-based, the panda noise-based method, just applies noise to the whole image, misclassifies it as nine. Uh, there is another method which focuses on a subset of neurons, 
So in that sense, it's similar to what we are trying to do, but it builds attacks. We are trying to build defenses for attacks. So these pictures look similar and they are misclassified also as three, but we find an advantage of DLV that we can find example with smaller average distance. And that uh, is linked to transferability of the adversarial examples. Another example here, I'm showing you a misclassification which is obtained by working directly in the first hidden layer. So this is where I need to be able to map back. Okay, so what I forgot to say that if you have a point in the middle layer, it doesn't come from a single point, it comes from a set of points in general. And at this point, I need to exercise SMT uh, for something like ReLU to, to find all the points. And in fact, any of these is an adversarial example. So I can show any of these. I'm just showing you the ones that are close to the boundary. Sigmoid actually has an inverse, but for uh, ReLU, it doesn't have. Another example that I have, so these are image nets. So what you can see is something which is a street sign. And this one is classified as a birdhouse. You get a lot of these traffic lights, you know, classified as oven or, you know, something else. So, but you can see here what kind of manipulations and scratches we had to do in order to, you know, for it to find. But this was found automatically by the tool. The tool just searches. It doesn't do a targeted attack, which is also possible to do. You can, you can search, for example, for a misclassification, you know, of a red sign as a green sign. Um, and But here is an example where just working with features and a small proportion of features, so this is also ImageNet, it actually doesn't find anything. And this is also an example which tells you that the tool is able to track these features because the features are, you know, edges. It just builds through image recognition through edges. Um, so 20 thousand dimensions, okay, is, uh, but there were three million dimensions. Dimensions, I mean neurons. Uh, another example here, there is literally just one red pixel, but the classification changes from one class of a dog to another class of a dog, okay? I probably wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> uh, I think I would probably worry more, you know, about these kinds of things, but... Uh, um, and here, I'm showing you an example where you have a class change from Labrador ret Retriever to a lifeboat. Now, this is something where you can't just decide, okay, I'm going to add it to training, because you really need to think about the underlying semantics. I mean, there is already a lifeboat there. You know, is it a labeling problem in this case? So that's, I'm just, you know, there is a lot that I think comes here from machine learning. So I just wanted to bring this, you know, to the conclusion. So I wanted to stress that, you know, this is a new area. Neural networks are uh, also new to me. And we have a first uh, framework that, you know, you can experiment with, but it's very, very limited. So even though we can show results for large examples, at, uh, large images, it's still uh, very, very limited, and there is a lot that we need to do. And in fact, I think one aspect that's, you know, kind of staring at me, obviously, in there, that this is essentially, because this is a probabilistic inference problem, you know, can we link it to probabilistic reasoning in some way? Uh, but, you know, there are also other, other uh, approaches that, you know, we can work with. And just to finish off, I'll just uh, show you that, in fact, you know, this problem that uh, I was telling you about is just one problem that I'm working on, but this belongs to AI safety. And there are papers, a lot of papers, about challenges for AI safety, and it's an obvious field for the verification community. Uh, you know, to to move into, and I was pleased to see some papers at CAV already trying to, you know, come up with some kind of guarantees or fairness for machine learning programs. But, you know, it goes 
further than that because uh, since robots are you know, coming everywhere, and I'm one of the people who says that an autonomous car is a robot, but so is a care robot, uh, for example, or you know, a waiter robot that you can find in the restaurants. It turns out that we humans tend to overtrust these robots, as did the Tesla driver, unfortunately. So we are already developing techniques to uh, formulate and reason about trust, the kind of trust that we humans, you know, develop in uh, in robots and uh, something that uh, you would then want to use also to program the robots to help them in their decision making because they will need to build relationships with humans and humans will need to be build relationships with robots. Just think about firefighter teams. Uh, that's already, you know, conceived and justify, explain decisions and also in accountability. And that goes beyond trust. Trust is about relationships, uh, but these robots will also need to be taught. So from last week, um, a, a headline from The Economist is about teaching robots uh, right from wrong. This actually came just as we were organizing a workshop on morality and trust in uh, the robotics conference. So this is also something that's worth looking at uh, because there is a lot of logic in here, in their logic and verification. Okay, so I just wanted to say thank you for this. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge my collaborators and funders and I wanted to say see you in Oxford next year. Thank you, Marta, for a great and inspiring talk. Uh, since we have a coffee break, maybe we can take a couple questions. If people have any, please come up to the microphone here. Just one question. Is Z3 good enough for you? Z3? Yeah. Uh, no. no, scalability is... Yeah, it's impossible. And at the moment, the problem is just finessed into Z3. Right. I think, yeah, um, I mean, ideally, you would want to be able to reason about ODEs, but we haven't got there. And so See, so at the moment, you know, I'm not. Ideally, you would want, you, I have, you know, functions which are ODEs, and that's what I would want to be doing, you know, in the long run, rather than looking at a point mapping. is uh, uh, how efficient is the classification in terms of computation time? I mean, can it be integrated in an online classification tool? Um, so which classification? Do you mean classification of what? When we perform a classification of a sample, can it, uh, how long does it take to give the uh, a guarantee about the robustness along with the classification? Uh, uh, well, so that depends on the size of the network. You know, this is an exponential <laughs> problem. That's the complexity of the problem. Uh, but, you know, but uh, so at the moment, this approach, the verification approach is really for offline. Okay, for online, I think we need to do something else. For online, we should be able to employ probabilistic um, guarantees. Okay, so you will probably, at that point, you will be looking for high probability of doing something, which should be possible. Uh, I think I have some ideas for that, but not do an exhaustive verification of this kind. Well, I think, you know, th so that uh, stop sign and, you know, birdhouse is just an example to say that sometimes, you know, my tool may be looking for just wrong adversarial examples. I mean, I, 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 the point that I was making there is we really need to have very high quality labeled data. 
and talking to people who train these neural networks for driving, I know that they put a lot of thought, uh, but even with a lot of thought, there are still situations, and it has happened, I've heard, you know, even in the NVIDIA case, when they had to retrain, you know, in emergency, because there was some particular situation that they've never seen before. Uh, but, okay, so also the um, birdhouse, traffic sign versus, you know, birdhouse is an analogy to, uh, you know, a situation that happened with the Tesla fatal accident. I mean, how come the Tesla confused the side of the truck with the sky? And the car does something completely different, okay? And if this is just based on camera and not LiDAR input, which can detect the distance, then you can imagine, you know, what danger there could be. Yeah. I don't have all the answers, you know, so. <laughs> I have a question concerning the safe manipulations. Um, yeah. Should they maybe also be learned or is, have they be handcrafted? Um, when we, when I've <laughs> understood more what they should be, um, uh, I think <laughs> I mean, they will be problem specific. Okay, that's the one thing uh, that I know. And if you focus on natural image recognition, for example, you know, like the one that's used in, in, the, um, you know, uh, in the car, then I will need to consider a certain class of manipulations, whether, okay, that you wouldn't use in other types of, you know, natural image recognition problems. You have a lot, in, for example, in face recognition, you would need to consider snow. Uh, but in the situation that I was talking about, uh, you know, we are now looking towards vision experts to try to find better similarity metrics and also, you know, operations or, you know, uh, maybe methods which actually give you, you know, more or less for free invariants under, you know, some sort of typical rotation angle changes, etc. I mean, that's effectively what the convolutional network does. It learns to to ignore, you know, these aspects, but you have to train it. Maybe one more, yeah. More of a technical question. Are you running your techniques on models of a neural network or an actual implementation? And do you think would it make a difference? Uh, well, we take the actual trained network. So we take the weights, the actual weights. You take the actual weights, but we then you're modeling it in, uh, in Z3 or something yeah. like that. So it's, it's not... We, we take the actual nets and, yes, trained weights, and we model it Z in the Z3. So if you think about it, if you want to retrain it, you'd get different weights and you'd need to rerun it. You'd need to rerun the check. That's uh, right, but there in, in Z3 you're assuming like an ideal world, like the real numbers and it's not yeah, implemented yeah, with floating yeah, point. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, there are very, I mean, you know, we, you know we, we have exactly the same difficulties as people have working with real numbers. And this is really, you know, the starting point. I'm sure people will tell me how we can do it better with real numbers and constraint solvers. Okay, one last one. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, so, if I understand correctly, you showed that some images from ImageNets are robust, right? Sorry, the... Uh, you showed that some images from ImageNet are point-wise robust, so that you proved that you cannot find any adversarial example in that area. Uh, is that correct? Like... Uh, uh, for, sorry, for which I didn't quite catch the... Ah, uh, sorry, yeah. Which I, nets? I, uh, the image net. So I think you showed some pictures and you said that you proved them to be safe, like robust. Um, some N pictures You mean the MNIST net? Um, no. Or on image net. Oh, the oh, image net. Yeah. No, 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 no. I cannot prove, I only show it under assumptions. Okay. On a specific... Point. Yes, so uh, in fact, so yes, for a specific point, for a specific image. So uh, if I show you, this is the, this is the limitation. So for ImageNet, for the two-point network, I can do full verification. Uh, for this one, uh, what I do is I only explore 20,000 of three million dimensions. I do it in every layer. 
and I select the dimensions, so they are most extreme features, and that's what you can see there, that it's actually showing you these most extreme features. But this is done on uh, this type of machine, on a Mac. It is not done on a GPU, and it's straightforward to parallelize it. So, so uh, I could scale this up. I just am not sure I want to do it that. I guess a general question that I have is how does this, so this gradient descent based methods that are used to find attacks, um, they've been shown, for example, in training to be, to converge very well, like to converge close to a global maximum in some cases. So I wonder if there is things you believe that you can draw from these methods, gradient descent based methods, and incorporate in SMT based methods to speed up or prune the search space away or if you have any intuition about this kind of connections? Um, yes, so, I mean, gradient descent methods is, you know, I actually, the, the, you know, the pictures that I showed you were from the blog of Ian Goodfellow, who, you know, worked on gradient descent. And his point, uh, you know, he understands the challenge of verification because his point is gradient descent will just try to minimize the function, try to go to the local minimum. But every time you start it, it will go in a slightly different direction. So it doesn't give you any guarantees of finding these adversarial examples. If we knew how to combine SMT with probabilistic search efficiently, oh, yes. But I think that's you know something that may be you know constrained. You know people who develop. Uh, SMT solvers can do. I mean, you know, SMT solvers have to, they have to learn from clauses. They already, you know, explore search. So maybe there is something in there. I don't have the answers because that's not my area. Okay, thank you. Well, let's thank Marta again.